Good morning and welcome to today's session of Metrology Cafe. My name is Adrian Yates. I'm here with our senior applications engineer, Alan McNeil. Today's Metrology Cafe will feature the Artec Leo 3D handheld scanner. Before we move over to Alan for the live demonstration, I'd like to take a moment and introduce you to the Artec Leo. The Leo is a portable handheld 3D scanning solution designed for completely wireless operation, allowing for maximum freedom and flexibility while scanning. The onboard processing of the Leo and the ability to capture up to 3 million data points per second without the need for reference markers makes it one of the fastest and easiest to use 3D scanners available. Artex 3D scanners capture full color data from the object being scanned with high resolution, resulting in accurate, detailed scans of most objects. Artec 3D scanners are used in a wide range of industries, including quality control, automotive, heritage preservation, reverse engineering, and architecture. Before I pass the presentation over to Alan, I'd like to mention that at the end of the demonstration, you will be receiving a feedback survey. We would appreciate it if you could please complete it and send it back at your earliest convenience. If there are any questions regarding the Artec Leo, or if you require an application specific demonstration, please email sales at cmmxyz.com. Without further delay, I will now pass you over to Alan where he will demonstrate the three step process of scanning an object, optimizing the data set, and then creating a scan file compatible with CAD CAM systems. Alan, over to you. Great, thanks a lot, Adrian. So as Adrian had mentioned, we're going to be taking a look at the Artec Leo today. I'm going to capture some live data after going through the, the basics of the hardware, and then I'm going to bring it into Artec's processing software, Artec Studio version 15. The Leo itself, as Adrian had mentioned, it's, it's uh, incredibly easy to use and it's completely self-contained, so it's unbelievably portable. To scan with this system, all I need is this unit in my hand here. It doesn't need to be tethered to a laptop. It doesn't need to have an external screen. There's one built into the, the system on the back here that I'm going to get into in a minute. But the system itself is weighs about five and a half pounds. Uh, it's nicely balanced uh, by the computer built in the top half of the unit. And then on the bottom half of the unit, we've got a battery pack and the connections for Ethernet and uh, the battery charger. The system itself is running, as I mentioned, a very high powered processor. It's on the NVIDIA Jetson platform, and it's the scanner's own internal computer, which features a quad core processor from NVIDIA, as well as the NVIDIA Maxwell GPU um, processing system. The scanner, um, being that it's portable, the operating principle for this scanner is pretty interesting actually. So it tracks like a lot of scanners do um, the 3D contours of the part. So there's no need to apply any targets. There's no targeting system following the scanner in space. It's just completely handheld and independent to itself. But as I'm scanning with it, as it's tracking across the part, it's matching scan data up to other scan data based on not only the contours that it sees on the part, but also color information. So it's capturing full texture, full color off of that part as well. And it's even using that information to help it um, as it scans along. In some cases, you might have something, imagine a wall without very much uh, unique for surfaces on it or so on and so forth. It actually has a built-in nine degree of free, uh, freedom inertial system as well, which includes a gyro, an accelerometer, and even a compass. So without even having something to scan, as I'm moving the scanner around, it's tracking those motions in three-dimensional space, which aids in its, its ability to track an object while it's scanning uh, incredibly. So I'm going to switch over now um, to a different camera view so you guys can see what I see on the back of it while I'm scanning. So it's got a five and a half inch touch, touch screen which is when I load up the system, it's just on its file manager now. So you can see I've scanned a number of projects and I can just scan through those. And at any time, if I wanted to add data to one of those projects or um, open up one of those projects and kind of take a look at it, I can actually just click on it and start moving that data around. Um, built into this system, as I mentioned, it's completely self-contained. So to adjust any settings on the system, I don't need to attach it to my computer or my laptop or whatever it is that I'm using it with, um, it's entirely uh, set up on its own. It has a Wi-Fi card on it as well, and I'm currently connected to my local area network. 
um, what makes the, the what that makes uh, useful on the system is say I wanted support from the manufacturer. I can hit this support tab. Sorry, I missed it. Hit the support tab, and then the manufacturer has the ability now to log into my system and start uh, diagnosing issues or trying to upload firmware, etc. Um, has the ability to connect to both a wireless and a wired network. And I'm just going to turn on this function here. It actually has the ability to cast to a browser too, which we'll be using in the live scanning section in just a minute. If I switch over to the scanner here, um, back into my projects, I'm going to start a new project. So I'll hit the new project button and it'll turn on a live view of my scanner. What I see when this live view pops up is an overlay. Now, when I'm scanning with the system, you're just going to see the live 3D image, but I've got a number of tools that I'm able to use here and unfortunately, gets incredibly bright here on the screen, so you can't really see what I'm what I'm seeing on the system. But I have the option of changing settings like the, the field of view of the system, which I hadn't mentioned. Um, the working distance for the scanner is anywhere from 0.35 of meters, so 35 centimeters, all the way up to 1.2 meters, which is an incredibly large volume for this kind of scanner. Its resolution on points is 0.2 millimeters baseline resolution for the scanner. We'll talk a little bit that uh, while we're processing the data later. Um, its point accuracy is 0.1 of a millimeter and its 3D point um, accuracy over a distance is 0.1 of a millimeter plus three millimeters per meter. So if we were measuring say two features a meter apart, the tolerance would be plus or minus 0.4 millimeters. I'm gonna switch now over to the live browser view of the scanner so then you'll see what I see whilst I'm scanning. What you see live on screen now and I'm going to show you a couple uh, features of the scanner. So it has the ability to automatically remove the background. And you can see that grid. I'm, my part is sitting on top of just a flat table and it's recognized that all that scan data on the flat table is probably the base. If I wanted to scan that area I can turn that back on and now the software will actually um, scan the table. But if I turn the base removal off, there it's gone. Over the range of the scanner, we are set up, I mentioned earlier, we can go from 0.35 up to 1.2 meters. And I can adjust that with a slider here on the fly. So if I had a larger part, I might want to have a larger scan area. This is a relatively small part, so I'm going to reduce my scan area down to something much smaller. Um, and that allows me to you know, limit the amount of data that I'm capturing. So pull the trigger. You notice that it's showing me multiple colors on screen. What those colors are representative of are the distance I am from the part that I'm trying to scan. So as I start to move around, you notice the software is live tracking on screen following what I am doing or how I am moving and every, all the data that it's capturing while I'm moving and just trying to maintain in that nice uh, bright green area. Okay, so I think I've got most of the data there. I'm just going to pull the trigger once to stop that. Plug the scanner in. It's an Ethernet cable that's attached to my computer, and I'm going to switch over to Artec Studio. Now, I just want to make sure that I'm presenting my live screen here. So if I select. So again, sorry for that little glitch there. I'm not entirely sure what had happened, um, but we're live again, so that's, that's important. I'm going to import the project from the Leo. So as I connect to the scanner, sorry, we're still in the scan data. I'm gonna to connect to my scanner. And import that project data. While it's importing the data here, I can talk a little bit about um, the information that it collects and how it uh, processes all the data. The system itself um, on the Leo, it's capturing all of the frames of the 3D data. It's capturing all of the color information of that data, but it hasn't fully prepared the model. So that's why we bring it into our tech studio. Our tech studio um, is a very nicely laid out package, to be honest with you. 
On the left hand side of the screen, working from top to bottom is essentially a typical workflow. On the right hand side of the screen is my object viewer or uh, data object viewer. And in the center, I've got obviously a large 3D window. I can pick and choose what data I do and do not want to show or use while I'm uh, working in the project. You can see I've got a couple scan groups that I've already been working with. If I don't want to work with scan group number one, I can just suppress it. I'm just working in scan group number two here. A note about the data that you see here, it doesn't look great, does it? Um, that's not an issue. This is a very low quality rendering so that they were able to apply the texture or the color information to the point cloud whilst we were pro processing it. If I wanted to switch this over to a different format, let's say if we just take a look at the point cloud, you can see it's actually quite a nice looking organized and smooth point cloud. There's a little bit of noise coming off of the surfaces, which is expected with this type of scanner. Um, none of that's an issue and everything looks great. So I'm going to go back to the solid view because I find it's while I'm processing things um, easier to actually look at this. The software does come with an autopilot mode. So if I select the autopilot button, it presents me with, uh, it's basically a macro that it's going to run and it's going to walk me through all of the basic steps for creating my finished model. I'm going to accept the data that it's selected here. So I've already got it selected on the right hand side of my screen. I want to use scan group number two. I'm going to click the next button. Registration, it asks me, is there any registration errors? So sometimes what will happen on a self-tracking scanner like this is some of the scan groups won't line up over top of the other scan data. If that was the case, then I would tell the software, I do see, I, sorry, I see the registration errors, and then it would help me figure out the best way to best fit all of that scan data before it starts to merge all the data together. So I don't see any registration errors, so I'm gonna accept that. And then we've got the model creation steps. So working from the top down, I'm going to um, answer some questions for the software and supply a little bit of information about the object that I've scanned as I understand them. And they're in layman's terms, which is quite good. So if I take a look at the scan quality for the geometry of the part, there's a question mark beside this. And if I select that, it really breaks it down into simple and easy to understand concepts. So things that are difficult to scan and difficult to process are flat geometry, fine geometry, and repetitive geometry. The opposite of those being rich geometry, large geometry, and unique geometry. If you can imagine a part that had all flat surfaces, the software actually has a really difficult time reconstructing the part based on the fact that it, it's using the, the curvature of the part to define how the, the shape of the part and how it should look. So in cases where it's got flat geometry, if it's got a lot of repetitive shapes, say vertical stripes or even a, a bunch of uh, a symmetrically spaced features on the part, that's difficult for the software. Um, in this case, I have good geometry, so I don't need to worry about it. But if I switch that to bad, the software would operate different parts of the algorithm that aren't necessary on this part. Scan quality for texture, the same thing. I'll just click on this. As I mentioned earlier, it not only uses the geometry on the part, but also the texture on the part or the colors of the information on the part to help best fit the all these things together. And if it had like a unique pattern, like something organic, like tiger stripes here, they're showing that's really easy for the software to fit together because there's only one way for it to fit together. A repetitive pattern like equally sized vertical stripes presents a challenge because it can't really use this information because that's going to be the same in various areas of the part. Again, that's not the case here, so I'm just going to go with good and good. Hard to scan surfaces. I think everybody knows this these days, but shiny things, black, black um, objects, anything that's too fuzzy or transparent are really difficult to prepare a mesh over top of. Um, the opposite of those being matte, white, smooth and solid objects. Um, these are not hard to scan surfaces. It's a nice matte gray object. Um, 3D noise on the model. Again, I'm not gonna say there's much noise because I don't see a whole lot here. Uh, the object size, the software, again, gives me a couple suggestions. This is a small object, so I'll select small. Anywhere from 50 to 200 millimeters is considered a small object for the scanner. Hole filling method. This is pretty nice if you're going scan straight to 3D printing. We can tell the software we need to have a watertight model because the 3D printers need this to be able to print them. 
I'm not going to fill the holes on this object because I didn't make any attempt to scan the bottom of the part. And given that, um, it won't be able to fill that in. It's looking to fill in small holes, maybe like this object, this little opening I have over here. Uh, it would fill those, and I can actually tell it, you know, fill it, but fill it by radius and then adjust um, what size that radius would be. I'm just going to leave don't fill set. Um, model resolution and polygon count, I'm going to leave those set to auto. The software will figure it out on its own. And I'm not going to apply the texture or the color information to the STL file right away. So if I select the next button, it asks me, do you want to edit anything? Is there any data here that you need to delete? I don't see that, so I'm going to skip this step. And it's going to go right into registration, which is the best fit alignment of all the scan. You can see it's already applied that. Um, removes any outliers, so noise off of the surface. It's deleted all of that, and now it's fusing the object. The fusion is the polygonization of the file. So if I click OK now, here is the full 3D rendering or full 3D uh, model uh, from the scan session that I've just run through. The final step here, and I'm going to add the 3D information. Actually, I wanted to take a look quickly. I still have all of the scan data set here, but it has hidden the scan, so I can bring those back if I want. But what I wanted to take a quick look at was the frames, which is each individual scan that I took off of this model. Because I've already finished the registration process and I've already finished using this, it knows exactly how many polygons it has in each frame, and I can look at each frame independently if I want to. So this again is all raw data. But as I scroll through this op uh, this screen, what you'll notice is some of the frames actually have color information applied to them. And one of the things they've done to help manage the amount of data that the software is working with is it's not capturing the color information with every single frame that it takes. It's kind of picking and choosing on its own the number of frames it thinks it needs to take and tries not to reproduce that. So you notice every so often I'll see a new tile with frame, uh, the color frame on it. So as I slip back to this, I'm going to go to the texture, which is really the coloring object. I'm going to select the whole group of scans that we just used to prepare the model. And then I've got a few other options here. Um, if there was a lot of glare and maybe there is on this, then I can tell the software to reduce the glare because it did take pictures with a camera. So if there was a surface that was highly reflective, certain areas on this might be shining just as you would expect if you'd taken a picture with a camera. I can reduce the glare. I can um, turn that off. I'm going to use the full setting there. And now it's going to apply to every single polygon in the model um, color information for each of these. And it doesn't color it based on a solid information for each polygon. It's actually coloring the model um, based on the information it had when it uh, scanned it. So if we move this around, this looks an awful lot like the part that I was just measuring. And you'll notice there used to be a sticker that was on here when it was painted that's been taken off. So you got this little circle here. You can see where the paint has been worn off and it's truly a digital twin or a digital copy of my little training part. So once I'm finished this, uh, a lot of the applications, as Adrian had mentioned, the film industry uses this a lot. It's used a lot in um, the architectural industry and the uh, archaeological industry and stuff. So you can imagine a museum capturing old artifacts. They'll scan this, they'll get a full color model, and then they don't have to disturb the original object anymore while they're studying it. And then there's some options in here for adjusting things like brightness. I am not an artist in any way, shape, or form, but if I wanted to maybe take a look at my part, take a look at the model, I can adjust things that are more camera-based than 3D modeling based. I'm going to reset them because that looks much worse than what the camera, the software had already decided. So if I apply all of that, there we go. The output formats, I could now export this model as an STL file, which will remove all of the color information, or if I wanted all the color information in the polygonal model, then I would use an OBJ. The OBJ would probably be what you would send to a 3D printer, and you could reproduce this off a 3D printer in its entirety with all of the color information intact. One of the latest innovations that our tech had come out with, and I didn't bother using it when I processed this because I didn't think it would really help the, uh, the process at all, but I'm going to close this project and open a different project full of just sample scans 
that were supplied to us by our tech. I'm going to turn on all of these. Actually, I think I'll take a look first at this car wheel in the standard definition. So with Artec Studio 15.1, Artec tried a completely new method of developing their algorithms for um, building the model, for understanding what the noise is, understanding how to reproduce, uh, digitally reproduce the physical, physical object that it had scanned. And they ran an AI engine through a ton of different scans, good data, bad data, um, and allowed that AI engine to develop the algorithm for generating all these surfaces. So what we have now is a scan that was actually taken by a different Artec scanner. This wasn't from the Leo, I believe this was from the Artec EVA, but they're very similar in their capabilities in terms of the scan quality. So this is the back end, obviously, of a hubcap. And if I turn on the HD version of this, this is the standard definition. And you'll notice when we get in very close on it, we've got these kind of rough edges and you'll have filled in areas. This is actually meant to be a gap on the original part, but it was filled in by the fusing algorithm. So if I switch this over now to the HD algorithm, and what's really important to note here is this is just software based. So if you're already an Artec user, um, you say you have an EVA, you have the ability to create scans that look just like this simply by updating your software to Artec Studio 15.1. And how much sharper, how much smoother, how much nicer is this scan compared to the original? get into some more mechanical type parts. I've got this compressor here. Uh, one of the other things that we tend to get on, especially a, a scanner that's capturing the, the color information, but most white light systems or structured light scanners have this thing, it's called texture bias, where you'll start to see the impression of text that was actually flat. So this could be a printed label on the part and if I zoom or if I switch out over to this one, you'll notice the texture bias. So there is no surface texture here whatsoever. There's no curvature. There's just a label that was applied to the part. And as it was scanned, because it sees different colors and textures, it tricks it into thinking there's geometry there. So the addition of the HD um, algorithm also improved texture bias. And then one more thing that I wanted to take a look at was say this standard definition dual clutch transmission box and if i scroll out from a distance this thing looks beautiful but as we scroll in we'll start to notice that the fine details tend to get quite washed out so this was a cast item and this was uh, embossed on the surface and then where we really find a big difference is in how the software used to deal with holes and how it would reconstruct a hole on the edge of a hole this was a machine surface and it was kind of shiny and you end up because it's a shiny surface with a little bit of noise and bridging off of the edge of the hole. When you reconstruct a model, this is what you end up getting, it is kind of a blobby shape on the edge of the hole. So if I switch this over to the HD reconstruction, you've actually got something now that you could try and measure. Um, and it goes from a reproduction for say the movie and film industry into something that's really getting closer and closer into a valid method of inspection. Um, certainly for the machine features, the cast features on this, absolutely the system would be more than accurate enough to capture most of that and to use for inspection. The final thing that I'll point out, standard definition, I said we're in all industries nowadays. My entire uh, career has been spent measuring parts, but we get asked for all kinds of stuff. So I've got the skeleton model here and you can see throughout the ribs here, um, blank areas or negative spaces the previous generation algorithm had a lot of difficulty capturing all of this space between the ribs. So if I switch over to the HD version of it, not only has it figured out, now there was no manual editing of this file whatsoever. It was the exact same scan data used to prepare just with the different algorithms. And if I scroll in here, not only did it capture all the white space, but it's actually got through the ribs and captured and reproduced uh, the spinal column as well. So I just wanted to give you guys kind of a look at um, some of the HD reconstruction abilities. Uh, the reason we wouldn't do this in a live demo was it does take a little bit longer to process it. And 
it doesn't take a lifetime, but it does take more time. And in a live demonstration like this, I just didn't think it was the right forum to be spending five to 10 minutes processing data. But if you guys are interested, if you think there's an application for you guys, we would love to come scan your parts and show you what the Artec Leo can do for you guys. So with that, I'd like to remind you, if you have any questions, please send them by email after the, the fact, and I'll send you back to Adrian. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you everybody for watching. As Alan said, if there are any questions, please email sales cmmxyz.com and we'll get them answered for you. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day and stay safe.